Johnny Versace. He was entering his house. We just heard gunshots go right outside. He's on the steps of the house. He was killed in a very, very public and bloody way. You can see his blood on the steps. Who did this? How could this happen? We knew there were previous killings. Who was Cunan and why would he kill Versace? Everybody was scared. Don't go out of the house. Be careful. They said he's a master of disguise. He could have a wig on or anything now. You would look at the pictures of Andrew Cunanan on the news, and it seemed like you were looking at four totally different people. He was kind of the phantom menace. You never knew when he was going to strike again. Everybody's at risk. We have new details on this story that broke. People are being warned to stay away from this area. Everybody converged on that scene. Who's in there? If it's Cunanan, can we capture him alive? City in Fear. Here's John Siegenthaler. Miami is known for its beautiful beaches and exotic nightlife, but on the morning of July 15, 1997, a cold-blooded murder in broad daylight created a worldwide media frenzy. It led police on one of the biggest manhunts the country had seen since the search for the Unabomber. Miami Beach is like a perennial vacation. It always feels like you're going home to your hotel, even if you're not. And after a 12-hour workday, it's still fun to go home. I've lived here over 50 years, and I came from Brooklyn, and uh, it was like coming to a heaven. It's a playground for the rich and beautiful. It's romper room. And uh, the big, bad, ugly world is not supposed to intrude. In 1997, among the rich and famous living on Miami's glamorous South Beach is Italian fashion designer Gianni Versace. I think Gianni loved Miami Beach because it represented freedom and ultimate liberation. And when he got to Miami Beach, I think he knew this was his new home. But the great thing about Gianni is that he just didn't live here. He was an active participant. He really transformed the way we see Miami Beach. He loved laughter. He was always surrounded by beautiful people. He created excitement. Yet he was such a quiet, docile kind of a man that the excitement was all around him. Johnny was very friendly, very approachable, uh, easy to speak to, very uncelebrity like You really enjoy just kind of hanging out with people, and you really would not even know he was famous. He was just a regular guy hanging out at the bar, drinking his soda. But neither Johnny Versace nor anyone living in Miami is aware that more than 2,000 miles away, a young man's murderous rage will soon have a shocking impact on their lives. San Diego, California, living in the city's gay community and enjoying the company of older, wealthy men is 27-year-old Andrew Cunanan. I knew him as Andrew De Silva. For six years, he had me and uh, most people in San Diego fooled. That spring, Mike Whitmore is living in the same San Diego neighborhood as Cunanan. Incredibly intelligent, uh, very articulate, traveled in uh, circles that were very influential. I met him at parties in La Jolla. Andrew led the perfect life of an American gigolo. His uh, benefactors were basically very conservative businessmen and many Republicans. The people that uh, he always had around him were uh, people of position or had a great deal of money. I mean, if you had position or money, then, then Andrew wanted to be your friend. All of a sudden, his last benefactor ends the relationship. You're Andrew, you're looking in the mirror and saying, my God, my American jiggle of life has come to the end of the road. My ex-lover has rejected me. No one is aware how much of an impact the rejection and loss of income have on Cunanan, but he is about to act on a terrifying impulse. 
After flying to Minneapolis, Cunanan tries to contact Jeffrey Trail, a 28-year-old Navy officer formerly stationed in San Diego. When Trail refuses to see him, Cunanan then tracks down ex-boyfriend David Madsen, and the two are spotted together in a Minneapolis nightclub. They were sitting up at the bar, and it was David Madsen, and Andrew Cunanan was on, just sitting on his lap. He's loud, uh, you know, makes a focal point of himself. April 27, 1997. After several attempts, Cunanan successfully lures Jeffrey Trail to David Madsen's loft apartment in the city's warehouse district. I believe he then went into a rage, and I think that that's when the murder spree began. Neighbors will later recall hearing shouts, followed by a series of loud thuds. Inside Madsen's apartment, Andrew Cunanan has bludgeoned Jeffrey Trail to death with a claw hammer, striking him at least 25 times. It started with Jeff. There's something that happened with Jeff and him. That's why this whole situation happened. Very sad. I mean, Jeff was a wonderful individual. May 2nd, leaving Trail's bloody corpse rolled up in a carpet, Cunanan takes David Madsen to a lake in nearby Rush City and shoots him three times with a 40 caliber pistol. Two fishermen will discover Madsen's body the following day. But even as Minneapolis investigators begin their search for the killer, Cunanan has already left the state, heading east to Chicago. On the morning of May 4th, police there make a grisly discovery in the city's luxurious Gold Coast district. A prominent real estate developer is found murdered in his Gold Coast garage. And tonight, police are trying to figure out who would brutally stab 72-year-old Lee Miglin and steal his luxury car. According to the medical examiner and police, this was a torture murder. 72-year-old Lee Miglin was tortured, then killed here at his Gold Coast home. The coroner determines that Miglin suffered multiple rib fractures, puncture wounds to the chest, and 19 blows to the head before his throat was cut with a garden saw. I just arrived myself from Los Angeles, and we're all just grieving the loss of my father. And I, we don't know any details of what's happening. Um, the police are still trying to put that together. Chicago police later find David Madsen's SUV parked near the Miglin home. After tracing the vehicle back to Minnesota and learning of the Madsen and Trail murders, Investigators begin to suspect that Andrew Cunanan may have randomly targeted and killed Lee Miglin for his car and money. Chicago police conduct a citywide search for Miglin's stolen 1994 Lexus, but come up short. May 11th, one week after the Miglin murder, Cunanan strikes yet another innocent victim, this time in New Jersey, where he shoots and kills cemetery caretaker William Reese. Bill was a nice guy, nice family man, Christian guy. My entire world and my son's world began to crumble. He was my best friend as well as my husband. And I lost both in the same day. Inside the cemetery, police find Lee Miglin's 1994 Lexus and determine that the killer has stolen a red pickup truck belonging to William Reese. With both murders now linked to Andrew Cunanan, the FBI puts Cunanan on their most wanted list. Up next, after four murders in three states, police begin a nationwide manhunt for a serial killer. May 1997. After committing a string of murders in three states, Andrew Cunanan, now on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, remains a fugitive. All the agencies, whether they be federal or local, there was a significant pressure upon them to find Cunanan as soon as possible. With Cunanan's picture now appearing on local TV news, citizens in the New Jersey area report seeing him in various locations. Where is alleged serial killer Andrew Cunanan? Waitresses at Olga's Diner in Malton nearby say they believe they saw Cunanan Sunday night around 8 o'clock. Last night about 8 o'clock I saw a man come running down the aisle. He went into the bathroom and then about maybe 10 minutes later the uh, police were here. 
So far, police leads are not panning out. The search for the man whose yearbook caption read, most likely to be remembered, continues. What investigators have no way of knowing is that Cunanan is headed to Miami, Florida. From New Jersey to Miami. That's a lot of time to think. What am I going to do to leave my mark in life? To make these people who rejected me remember who I am. May 12th, 24 hours after killing William Reese, Cunanan arrives in Miami. We had received information about Andrew Cunanan and the possibility that, you know, he could be in South Florida. And we began to look for this individual. We just started to hear some reports of him being in North Miami Beach. They certainly posted pictures up and wanted posters and tried to make everyone aware that there was a possibility he could be here, but still no one was really certain. What made him dangerous at the time was there was enough on paper and in newspapers as far as him coming in this direction. It wasn't something that was put together all after the fact. We knew that there were previous killings. Gunanan checks into the Normandy Plaza Hotel, registering under an alias and using a French passport as ID. Over the next several weeks, despite the FBI's ongoing search to find him, Cunanan blends in with the locals of South Beach and remains unnoticed. He could have been sunning himself on the beach and he would have looked, acted like everyone else in that circle on South Beach. He could be anywhere, he could be right next to you. July 7th, running low on money, Cunanan enters the cash on the beach pawn shop and gets $200 in exchange for several 18 karat gold coins stolen from his Chicago victim, Lee Miglin. Florida state law requires pawn shop owners to obtain a name, address, and fingerprint of anyone selling items. Once the form is completed, it is faxed to police. Without hesitating, Cunanan gives a thumbprint, uses his real name, and the actual address of the Normandy Hotel. I guess you don't ask a lot of questions as to why somebody's pawning something, but what did he say? No, he just came here and said to me, how much time do you give me for this? And that's his signature right there? Right. OK. The fingerprint is in the copy that I sent to the police. But police won't review the form for another eight days. Meanwhile, the FBI search for Cunanan is featured on several nationally televised news programs. Police are searching coast to coast for a man they suspect is a serial killer. They say Andrew Cunanan is responsible for the deaths of at least four people. It was the Chicago murder that led police to... Media believe. coverage of the Cunanan search leads to a dramatic 911 call on July 11th from a man in a Miami sandwich shop. 911, please. Yes, um, hello, uh, this is Kenny from Miami Subs. Uh-huh. I think I've seen this guy that I saw in America's Most Wanted, man. This is no joke. What is he wearing? What color a shirt? white T-shirt. I couldn't see because he came to the counter. All I could see is a white T-shirt, white hat, black shorts. Um, which way did he go? He's inside the store now. By the time police arrive at the shop, Cunanan has vanished. This is one person that has been able to elude both local and national authorities for a significant amount of time, somewhat of a chameleon within the general population, so he's hard to detect. He was quite smart, and he had probably been able to manipulate people his entire life. So now he's feeling, not only can I be able to beat other people, but you know what, I'm going to now challenge law enforcement to see if, in fact, they are as smart as I am. Among those who will later claim to have spotted Cunanan in the South Beach area is Frank Scottolini, then manager of a popular club called Twist. It was Saturday night, Sunday morning, sometime between 12 and 12.30. I remember him leaving Twist, walking out the door of Twist. And I happened to be standing outside the door, and in one second, that guy and I were face to face. And I felt my heart jump into my throat. And I turned to the person next to me and I said, that's a serial killer. And the person next to me was my assistant GM, who had no idea what I was talking about and thought I was crazy. I just wish I had, instead of turned to the person to my left, I would have said to the policeman who was standing less than five feet away from me, I think that's a serial killer. Do something about it. July 15th, 1997. 
Although Kunanan sightings in the South Beach area have many residents on alert, no one is prepared for the events of that morning. Sometime around 8.30 a.m., Gianni Versace walks to a newsstand a few blocks from his Ocean Drive mansion. He would get up in the morning, he'd walk over to the news cafe, buy all of his Italian and European newspapers, maybe have a coffee or something, then walk back to his house. I remember him leaving the newsstand um, right out here, uh, a couple of feet behind me, and that was it. He went towards his home, and I didn't give it a second thought. Less than a half hour later, Versace returns home. As he unlocks the gate outside his mansion, he is approached by a young man with dark hair carrying a backpack. I was on, on South Beach, you know, getting ready to take some sun, mm -hmm. and I heard two shots. Definitely sounded like a gun, a big gun. Coming up, a murder in broad daylight sends shockwaves around the world. I get goosebumps just thinking of that morning, that day. Who did this? How could this happen? July 15th, 1997. Just before 9 a.m., as famed fashion designer Gianni Versace unlocks the gate to his mansion on Ocean Drive, two gunshots ring out. When I got to the front of the house, I saw Mr. Versace lying uh, on the stairs on the outside of the gates, and I immediately just turned around to call 1911 because uh, there was nothing I could do there, and I know emergency had to be called. It's a shooting. I'm going to get additional. Okay. Okay. When paramedics arrive at the scene, Versace is barely alive. He will die minutes later on the way to Miami's Jackson Memorial Hospital. I turned right, and I saw Johnny on the stairs laid down and so we ran to him and he was shot twice on the head. It was laying right on the steps. It looked like an execution style. I was assigned right away to go to the crime scene, which was a massive crime scene. They had several blocks cordoned off in South Beach. I remember very clearly the blood on the steps of the Versace mansion and thinking, who would kill Johnny Versace? What could possibly be the motive here? As a stunned community tries to make sense of the brutal crime, eyewitnesses give police a description of the killer. A man described as a young white male dressed in a light gray or white shirt, dark shorts, white cap, and wearing a backpack, shot the victim and walked away. The actual murder happened during a shift change at Miami Beach Police Department. So they had officers coming and going they had so they had twice as many and they instantly devoted them sent them on the street looking for this guy station here you'll be here for a while oh, yeah. oh, okay i get goosebumps just thinking of the of that morning that day it was chaos everywhere especially not knowing where this person was who did this how could this happen a lot of people were freaking out Everybody didn't really know what was going on. It was kind of like a, a big shock. The news started broadcasting that there was a killer running around South Beach, and it was total fear. Absolute unbelievable shock that this was a public figure in our neighborhood that was murdered in a very brutal and public way. And that was the news coming to life in a way that I had never experienced before. And so, you're kind of dazed and confused. You have the wind kind of knocked out of you. Only hours after Versace's murder, police make a crucial discovery. In a South Beach parking garage, not far from Versace's mansion, they find some clothes stuffed under a red Chevy pickup truck. The vehicle is traced back to William Reese, the New Jersey man believed to have been murdered by Andrew Cunanan. That was just found within the last 24 hours. That links Cunanan uh, to the murder scenes in so many places and has further evidence linking him to it. Uh, it was, we felt, a key piece of evidence. Inside the vehicle, investigators find a receipt indicating the truck had been parked in the garage since June 10th. 
They also find Cunanan's passport and several items belonging to Chicago murder victim Lee Miglin. After receiving a tip from an eyewitness, police descend on the Normandy Hotel and search the room where Cunanan is believed to be staying. He appears to already be gone. We were all surprised at how many places he seemed to turn up. So it was only a matter of time before they would track him down. The question was, were they going to catch him before he killed somebody? We were all just trying to piece together this puzzle of who was Cunanan, why would he kill Versace, where was he? At nightfall, Cunanan is still on the loose. Police hold a press conference asking for the public's help. Cunanan is known to be a male prostitute who services affluent clientele. Cunanan is well-educated, well-dressed, is very articulate. Cunanan should be considered extremely dangerous and armed at this time. Nobody's safe in this, and that's a point we have to, we have to get across. Don't think that because you, you're, you're not gay that you're, you're not a possible victim in this thing. Everybody's at risk. Everybody's got to help us put this guy in jail. But while police urge the citizens of Miami to keep a lookout for Cunanan, many residents doubt if they'll be able to recognize him. You know, they said he's a master of disguise. He could have a wig on or anything now. You know, you would look at the pictures of Andrew Cunanan on the news, and it seemed like you were looking at four pictures of four totally different people. And the fact that no one really had that strong of a sense of what he looked like, it, it made everybody more paranoid. Andrew is a man that's unpredictable, very intelligent, can change his appearance. This is the worst nightmare for the FBI, unfortunately. As soon as they identified who this guy was, and we found out more about him, we thought, oh great, there's a crazed serial killer in our midst, like we don't have enough problems in South Florida. Now we have to deal with a serial killer running around who's killing people for God knows what reason. Coming up, with a serial killer at large, Miami becomes the scene of a media frenzy. Police are on heightened alert. The average Joe on the street is on heightened alert because uh, Cunanan is still on the loose. City in Fear. Once again, John Siegenthaler. In the days after fashion designer Johnny Versace was shot to death on the steps of his South Beach mansion, the hunt for his killer intensified. Investigators were certain Andrew Cunanan was still in Miami. The question was, would he strike again? After Gianni Versace was murdered and Andrew Cunanan was at large in the community, the level of fear was palpable. I mean, it was like electricity in the air. I definitely looked behind my shoulder when I went out and made sure I wasn't alone. So who knew when he was going to attack next and whether it would be a woman? I just couldn't understand why they couldn't find him. And someone had to see him, I imagine. Oh, it was terrified and hardly nobody wanted to come out anymore. We lost tourists, we lost billions of dollars. It kind of terrified Miami a while. People were concerned because if he had gone to South Beach and killed Gianni Versace, uh, you know, clearly he was capable of murder. And, you know, and, and here he was in our midst. People actually thought that he was next to them on the beach or in a bar and that their life was at risk, that he could kill them at random. Crime Stoppers. Cunanan was sighted everywhere at that time. You don't know if it was a, a true call or a false call uh, uh, because we were getting them everywhere. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to try to get a police unit to go by there. The police department must have gotten 100 calls an hour of Kunan and sightings, and I got to admit, I'd be driving around and seeing somebody looking kind of strange, and I would think that was him. So we were all a little bit in fear about it. Police wanted to get the word out. They distributed 2,000 flyers. South Beach is a small area. 2,000 flyers is going to blanket the, the whole area. They wanted to, A, warn the people, and B, maybe get somebody to help them if they spotted Cunanan. After the Versace murder, all of Miami was in kind of a, a panic and kind of scared state, and, but it was absolutely more elevated in the gay community because that's where he had always been found. It was a very disturbing time, it really was. In the nightclubs, people would always be thinking he was going to walk around the corner. I know some of the bartenders that I worked with there later did realize that he had been a customer of theirs. 
He had been at all these clubs that you thought were completely safe and harmless, and, and yet, you know, it's really freaky to think that there was a killer probably on the bar stool next to you at some point. In Miami Beach, it really had a profound effect. The beach was all about pleasure and relaxation and, and happiness and, you know, the restaurants, the clubs. Andrew Cunanan didn't just kill Versace, he killed the party. All the clubs toned down. The, the city was in fear, and it wasn't time to celebrate. We didn't want to celebrate. You know, how can you go out and really have a good time when something like this could happen right on your very doorstep? With such a high-profile citizen like Versace being murdered, media from all over the world descend on Miami and begin 24-hour coverage of the story, going after any angle they can find. Police are on heightened alert. The average Joe on the street is on heightened alert because uh, Cunanan is still on the loose. But so far, no real sign of the man suspected of killing Johnny Versace. Tonight, police are chasing several new leads. Police say there have been Cunanan sightings at various hotels, and now they are speculating that he may have shaved off all his body hair and may be posing as a woman. And it was an absolute circus. I remember one reporter from another station doing a story about dressing up in drag to show the difference, how different Cunanan might look, because there was this theory that he might be going around dressed as a woman. And we thought of every angle you could think of. Never-ending helicopters and uh, vans and interviews and phone calls and, and, and just people coming up to you constantly. There were points in time where there was more media in the club than there were patrons. There were just so many of them in here and wanted to talk with anybody they could, just anybody. It was a city under siege because the media had put us on the siege. It wasn't Cunana. They asked the logical question, what do we do? How, you know, are we safe? And I say, just lead your normal life. And don't become a detective trying to solve the crime. The police will take care of it. But police have few leads in the case and no knowledge of Cunanan's motive for targeting Versace. Police say this was not a random shooting, so what was it? A celebrity stalking or something personal? Detectives say there's absolutely nothing to suggest these two men had ever even met each other. Just to kill Versace, to kill him, we never understood if there was a connection with Andrew Cunanan and Versace. Did Versace have some type of encounter with this man that went bad or something? I don't know. But we just couldn't understand why he would target Versace. For several days after Versace's murder, Miami Beach police, along with teams from the FBI, searched businesses, restaurants, and other shops along South Beach. They also hope that a reward will encourage citizens to help lead them to Canana. Today, Dade County, in partnership with the city of Miami Beach, the Federal Bureau of Investigation announced the creation of a $45,000 reward for the capture and arrest of Andrew Philip Cunanan. With the media scrutiny, with the high profile situation, um, it just would build and build and build in anxiety. Coming up with reward money and coming up with ways to get uh, people involved. Everybody wanted this man taken into custody. Everybody wanted this investigation to be solved. Up next, a seemingly random burglary ends in a dramatic televised standoff. Is Andrew Cunanan aboard that houseboat? So now the stakes are really high, and it certainly looks like Andrew Cunanan. July 18th, 1997. Three days after the brutal murder of designer Gianni Versace, his friends and admirers gather for a memorial service at St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Miami. Everyone was just numb. I remember attending the funeral at St. Patrick's Church on Miami Beach, and there was so much sadness. Rejoicing in Versace as the person having been with us, but so much severe sadness. I had met Versace at a couple parties, and I didn't know him that well, but it was really, it was a big shock when a, a figure that you, you've come to, like, love or, or to really admire gets killed, like a Princess Di or someone like that. You're just, you're floored. You're just stunned. 
I felt like I lost somebody. I admired everything that he did. I thought he was a brilliant artist, not just a designer. And I thought it was a great loss. Four days later, on July 22nd, Milan, Italy's Duomo Cathedral is the scene of another emotional service attended by Versace's family and many of his celebrity friends. Meanwhile, despite an ongoing manhunt throughout South Florida, FBI investigators and Miami police are no closer to finding Versace's suspected killer, Andrew Cunana. We had information that, you know, he didn't have friends. He didn't have a support system in place that would help him. We were pretty sure that he was still here in South Florida, so every Cunanan sighting had to be followed up. And you got to take it seriously because you just don't know which one's going to be the one that's going to turn out to be real. Apparently, there have been sightings in this neighborhood in the last few days of people or, or somebody resembling uh, Andrew Cunanan. Then on Wednesday, July 23rd, word spreads throughout the media that there may be a break in the case. There was a, a whisper or a, a hubbub about the police converging and targeting a, a houseboat uh, right off Collins Avenue. We sent our photographer, our special projects photographer over there, and he actually hid in the bushes and tried to observe what was going on and actually gave us some good early lead that there might be heightened police activity there. Early reports indicate that the caretaker of the two-story houseboat at 5250 Collins Avenue had noticed the front door unlocked. When he walked inside, an intruder hiding upstairs fired a gun at him. We have new details on this story that broke just about the 5 o'clock hour. It started out as a reported burglary and has escalated into a massive standoff right now. NBC6 reporter Diana Gonzalez is live at the scene. The big question everybody is asking right now, Diana, is it Andrew Cunanan inside? Well, Steve, I asked that very question to one of the officers here on scene, and the answer was... We don't know. And right now they're operating under the assumption that the man is still inside the houseboat and that he is armed. People are being warned to stay away from this area for their own safety. And as soon as we get more information, we'll bring it live to you. And I remember we were among the first crews to get there and we, we didn't know exactly what was going on. We thought it was Cunanan in, in the houseboat, but there just wasn't a whole lot of uh, definite information coming out. Everybody converged on that scene. As the day wore into night, it became a, a spectacular scene with, with news and police helicopters flying overhead. And then, of course, everybody waited to see what was in there. Is Andrew Cunanan aboard that houseboat? They didn't know. So suddenly it's a story where the whole community's watching. We're in nonstop coverage, everybody. And by and by, the national media outlets, all the networks are picking up this coverage. It's a story the whole country's watching. So now the stakes are really high, not only for police, who's in there, if it's Cunanan, can we capture him alive and answer some of the questions about why he did it? And what's the latest from the ground level, Diana? More activity from the special response teams. Police are asking people who are driving around, residents who are leaving their buildings to get out of the way if they want to stay safe. Assuming the killer is Cunanan, Dr. Scott Allen, a senior staff psychologist with the police department, provides negotiators with a psychological profile of the alleged killer. So we're thinking that he's either going to try to really embellish his stature to try to have this really grandiose surrender, or he's going to kill himself right on the spot, or he will uh, set up a situation where he'll, he'll come out with his firearm and compel our tactical people to shoot and kill him. You've got a scene here where they have closed off the entire roadway. They have moved to position in front of the house, all around the house, so you don't want to you don't want to give anything away. The police department asked our helicopter to please back off that picture. There may be a television inside that houseboat if the suspect is still in there. As a result, if he is watching this coverage, they certainly don't want to tip off what they're going to do. Hoping Cunanan may be watching the television coverage, his friend Elizabeth Cote makes an on-air appeal urging him to surrender. Andrew, wherever you are, please stop what you are doing. 
you still have a chance to show the entire world the side of you that I and your godchildren know. The time has come for this to end peacefully. After nearly four hours with no movement or progress in the standoff, SWAT team members begin launching gas canisters into the houseboat. When there is still no response, commanders order the tactical unit to storm the houseboat. So I was actually the first guy going to the door without a shield. And at that time, I figured, OK, this is going to be the confrontation. So I prepared myself for anything that, had, that could have possibly happened. And I wanted to completely focus on whatever I had to deal with, threats, uh, hostage situation. But we weren't sure if there was a victim inside or, or, or anything. Officer Fletcher is the first to reach the second floor of the houseboat. I saw the gun in Commander's hand. He was actually in the line in the bed at the time. And I instinctively knew uh, that Kunanan was, uh, was no longer alive. And I immediately notified my team that Kunanan, 45. 45 means he's deceased. But with the world's attention focused on Miami, investigators are careful not to make any mistakes. When they found him dead there, he had shot himself in, in the mouth and his face was all splattered. They couldn't properly identify him. And there's no forensics men around to do the fingerprinting. At this time, we are waiting for the arrival of forensic units from the Metro Dade Police Department in an effort to try to preliminary identify the deceased. When we have that information, we will release it to you. How did it look like it? Imagine the description of Andrew Panani. Imagine the description of Andrew Panani. There is a similarity in the description of the of the victim uh, that was found. Beyond that, I would uh, I will tell you that there is no nothing else to indicate at this time that it is him. Thank you very much. There you go. I had a source say, all I can tell you is it's the same exact weapon that was used to kill Johnny Versace. And it certainly in every respect looks like Andrew Kanata. Coming up. And I asked the two most experienced fingerprint technicians that we had that they come. Life in Miami nearly grinds to a halt as citizens wait to learn the gunman's identity. Nine days after the shooting death of Gianni Versace, a dramatic televised standoff between police and a man barricaded inside a houseboat on Miami Beach has come to an end. Inside, police have discovered the body of a young man dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Throughout Miami, residents eagerly await confirmation that the dead man is Versace's suspected killer, Andrew Cunanan. The buzz here is exactly what Robin reported, that indeed the search for the fugitive Andrew Cunanan may have ended in dramatic, violent fashion here in that houseboat you see across the way right over there. The city manager was talking to me about it and he said to me, it's Cunanan. They know it's Cunanan, but they have to wait till the morning in order to get the forensics man to take the fingerprint. I said, are you crazy? You got a thousand guys from all over the world sitting here. They know it's Cunanan too, but they can't say it until you say it. And I asked the two most experienced fingerprint technicians that we had that they come to see if we could ID the body by printing the hands and then comparing it with that one thumbprint that we had on that pawn shop card. The ID was made. I was in contact with the mayor at the time. You had the mayor, you had the director of the police department, and you had the chief of Miami Beach, you had the special agent in charge of the FBI, Paul Phillip, and I think it was about 5 o'clock in the morning that they were able to, to identify Andrew Cunanan. ...in the United States Attorney's Office. Tonight, all across the nation, our citizens can stand down and breathe a sigh of relief. The reign of terror brought upon us by Andrew Cunanan is over. Thank you very much. Well, this was like a crescendo to a great symphony or something. I mean, this was, remember, you'd, you'd work 15, 20 hours a day on this, basically on the story nonstop. 
So essentially, this was the end, and it was a dramatic end. We felt satisfied because we accomplished our job. We brought peace back to Miami at that time. Thank God this is over. That was my overall emotion, because this had been something that had been consuming the media for weeks. When they cornered him, uh, we knew in our hearts he was there in that houseboat. And then when we found out that he had killed himself, uh, we knew he was gone. Then there was celebration. When I announced that this guy was dead, the crowd went nuts. And, uh, you know, drinks were on the house. It's time to move on. It's time to see the colors. It's time to hear the Latin salsa band on Ocean Drive, you know, and stop and dance. Yeah, I felt a lot of relief. And, I mean, the guy was definitely out of his mind. The, given the fear on the street, when they heard that he was dead, it was a great release. The, there were cheers. They announced it in bars around South Florida, and people cheered and, and, and toasted the fact he was dead. Signs went up on the street. Debt settled, they said. Uh, I saw a woman just walking down Ocean Drive screaming, justice has been served. Andrew Conan and his evil. They rejoiced in this man's death. Uh, it's a little bizarre, but that gives an indication of how it affected them. They, uh, you never saw such release. In the days and weeks following Cunanan's suicide, investigators try to unravel the mystery behind his deadly rampage. Police released about 700 pages of investigation several months after the case, and despite the volume of that material, it answered very little questions about Cunanan. They autopsied his body, but they could never dissect his motives. It's anybody's guess why he was brazen about that. Maybe he wanted to make a statement. Maybe he wanted to get caught. I can't fathom uh, doing what he did. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And obviously, he wanted to go out with a bang. Why did he ultimately pull the trigger on Johnny Versace? That died with him on Miami Beach. So it was one of those things that you never really got the fullest answer as to why this man ultimately decided to make that cross-country trek after a killing spree before and, and targeted Johnny Versace. Whenever... I think of Gianni, I think of the void that this man created in a lot of people's lives. This was a very famous, famous man, and he was, uh, he was killed in a very, very public and bloody way. When Versace was killed, Miami Beach lost a part of its soul. It lost Versace, and it has never recovered since fully, and I'm sure never will. Cunanan didn't leave evidence of his motive, but one theory is that unlike other serial killers, he may have had several reasons to kill. Jeffrey Trail and David Madsen may have been targeted for revenge. Lee Miglin and William Reese for opportunity, and, perha and perhaps Cunanan killed Gianni Versace to secure his own fame. That's a report.